Hi, uh, this is James O'Keefe, and welcome to another Massachusetts Pirate News. Um, we have four stories to discuss today, um, and really not much about the Supreme Court. Um, I'm before I get to who I'm with. Uh, we had our democracy and dog food meeting last Saturday, and we're going to have another one uh, this upcoming Saturday. Uh, at noon. So if you want to help with tech stuff, by all means, uh, you know, come onto the live stream and join us. So with that, um, I'm joined today by uh, Eli, uh, Joe and Steve. How are the three of you? Well, you know, I'm just fantastic, all things considered. I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay, too. Thank and how are you, Jeremy? I'm okay. It, the weekend is almost over. It's been wet, cool weather the last few days, and now we're getting back to the heat. So it'll all be fine. So uh, the first story is from New York City. Uh, the New York City Comptroller um, looked at 2022 data um, for the New York Police Department's use of shot spotter technology. Uh, they have 2,000 microphones and they, they have a contract for $22 million to use shot spotter. Uh, some of that, to be honest, is probably paid by the federal government. Um, but their audit found that 87% of the time, uh, shot spotter sent NYPD officers in response to loud noises that do not turn out to be confirmed shootings. Uh, in terms of improving uh, response time, it improved it by, I believe, 98 seconds when they're supposed to improve it by five minutes. Um, and additionally, there were, and this is only in Manhattan that they looked at it, uh, there were 156 confirmed gunfire incidents within the coverage area that were not identified by shot spotters, uh, by their shot spotter microphones. So, and, and that 98 uh, second difference is compared to 911 calls. So shot spotter generator report 98 seconds faster than someone calling in 911. So, um, we have been anti shot spotter for so many uh, privacy as well as just effectiveness of, you know, public dollars. Um, so <laughs> thoughts, gentlemen? I have one. Um, you know, skimming through the the audit report, one one section that just caught my attention was, um, you know, as part of the contract, NYPD wanted to have a, a service level agreement. You know, it's a reasonable thing to have. And one of so the performance standard here was that 90% of unsuppressed outdoor gunfire incidents using standard commercially available rounds greater than 25 caliber inside the coverage areas will be detected, will be detected within 25 meters of the actual location. Okay. The thing that real that caught my really caught my attention there is the you know the requirement for uh, to detect uh, something twenty five caliber or larger. Um, slightly smaller is a two twenty three, which is a common uh, type of round used in assault rifles. <laughs> now, I mean, considering that you know you've got this system that's supposed to detect firearms and you you basically have a service level agreement saying no yeah but you don't need to detect the ammunition that's commonly used in assault weapons um and mass like AR, <laughs> ar-15s and so on um so yeah i i just thought that was that was kind of funny <laughs> isn't a more common round that's used especially in inner cities like nine millimeter and that's way below 223 just saying no no nine, 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 nine three is it? Yeah, yeah. five point five six millimeter is two two three, so nine millimeters mm -hmm. bigger. But I thought five five six was a rifle round, and nine millimeter is a little bit smaller, isn't it? It's a pistol round, but the cartridges, but it is a a, a larger projectile. Yes, it, it's, you know, a, 40, it's a wider projectile. 
it's probably mm-hmm. shorter than a 5.56. Yeah. And it's a little smaller than a 45. Right. For those of you who don't know, 25 caliber is one quarter of an inch. 50 caliber, 12.7 millimeters is half an inch. So. And 50 calibers is hefty enough to, if you convert one of those, if you build a rifle to fire 50 caliber bullets, you can break your shoulder. <laughs> I know someone who did this. <laughs> yeah, I think well, that being said, have that are like long range sniper, uh, US sniper. Sorry, I interrupted. No, I was just going to say, I mean, just the financial like expenditure of resources when we can't even balance the budget on something that clearly isn't effective and is just wasting a lot of our officers' resources and time. We could be using their time much more effectively and more impactfully, like community policing or training on how to not pull your gun on civilians and knowing the law. Yeah, and I'd imagine that the like the MTA <laughs> could have used some of that money, especially now since... Um, you know, they have a big maintenance backlog. They were counting on congestion pricing to sort of meet their capital needs. And New York's governor just totally killed that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. For all the libraries that uh, mm-hmm. New York City has closed for some inexplicable reason. I don't know. It's not a lot of money. So $22 million would go a long way. Um, so we'll have links to the actual audit report as uh, well as a summary from hellgatenyc.com. Um, next up on it is uh, Galvin, uh, Secretary of State William Galvin spoke on WBZ TV. Uh, elections are our thing and he's in charge of elections. So Joe, uh, what's what's the update there? Yeah, so uh, he expressed a couple of concerns, uh, one with how a lot of people don't trust in the follow- the process. Now, I know that a lot of the times people don't, they, a lot of the incumbents don't even have anyone running against them, but, and a lot of people, thanks to social media and stuff like that, think it's, um, sorry, my son's in the background, uh, a lot of the... Um, He's, he's afraid that most people don't trust in the process. And so one of the things that I would have to say is we need to bring a lot more transparency. And, you know, they're always looking for people to volunteer at the polls. It is something that you can get paid for at most of them. Um, of course, they would accept volunteers, but it's something that you can actually go for a day and do. And so if you don't really trust the process, uh, take part in it. Be a part of it, mm-hmm. you know, and see how it's actually done. Um, and then the the other part, uh, oh no, they killed Joey. <laughs> <laughs> I think his kid got distracted him. Oh, well, well, there's, um, I mean, one of the things I thought was interesting about the Galvin article was, um, you know, his re- remarks on how much money is being spent on uh, ballot question campaigns. Like, uh, I guess one of them will be, um, you know, gig economy companies like, you know, your Uber and Lyft saying that, yeah, oh, yeah, our our workers are not employees or they're contractors and we can like, we don't have to give them benefits or time off or health insurance, or, you know, they just, they just take the money and we're not even going to pay 50% of the, uh, the employee, the, the employer's taxes, you know, um, I could see that one getting a lot of, getting a lot of spending, but hopefully, um, I, I, I hope, I hope the, our voters will, uh, will be, will be smart enough to see through that. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Sorry about that. I think I was having a minor case of serious brain damage. Mm. Um, I hope not. So, ah, you know, I take a lot of hits to the head. It's part of my life experience. Um, I thought it was one of those cases where, oh, yeah, the microphone isn't plugged in anymore. (laughs) No, I'm actually coming to you through my phone. If the the microphone is not plugged in, I have bigger problems. Uh, Ah, okay. But the other major concern that 
Galvin had was just um, how much money special interest groups are dumping into the ballot questions. And it literally has become a money pit. Whereas to even get a question on the ballot, you have to have so much financial resources to do it. And you have to come up with so much money in order to drive the campaign. It really just makes it so that only special interest groups are able to get those questions out there. So the big multi-million corporations like Uber, Lyft, or like where they're trying to block, trying to block uh, Lyft drivers from getting an hourly wage or things of that nature, um, which is absolutely ridiculous that they aren't considered full-time employees. Mm-hmm. You know, absolutely ridiculous that they don't get benefits and like everybody else, and they're not, or that gig workers in general are just not covered the way that they should be and totally skirting around all the labor laws. You know, there's a reason why we have those labor laws and a lot of people have sacrificed. And then these big corporations come in like, ah, forget about those. It's just, just like no. And so all these big corporations with all of their money and all their resources are able to just dump money and totally take away what should be a natural and democratic policy process that we fought so long and hard for so yeah, and those mean, are his, sorry go ahead steve I, I was gonna say one of the things that you know on that front one of the things that um i've been you know kind of happy to see is you know i i'm a bit of a labor history buff and you know who's spent who's read lots of books about you know the iww and the you know early auto workers unions and that sort of thing um, so it's nice to see union movements happening again, especially in places where, you know, unions have not had much of a presence historically. I mean, I, I think a, I honestly think a, like an Uber and Lyft, uh, a rideshare drivers union would make total sense. <laughs> but I would you know. take it even one step further in any professional driver to have a trucking union, to have a driver's union. Um, because the trucking industry is absolutely god awful to truckers. Mm-hmm. Um, Team, but te- Teamsters, man, get them all on the Teamsters. <laughs> you know, I mean that's the thing too. But you know, one specialized just for people who are professional drivers. Mm-hmm. That'd be amazing. My concern about claims that so much money is being spent is the the solution often seems to be well we have too many ballot initiatives and too much money is being spent so let's make it even harder to get a ballot initiative on uh that'll cut down on the amount of money and all that does is make it harder for smaller groups that don't have money to put forth a ballot initiative and that's that's my fear is that the, mm-hmm. we'll see some legislation somewhere that'll be well we're going to change it from i think it's 60,000 uh signatures you need to you know 100 or 120 or something um i mean already it's 2000 just to get on the ballot for US House of Representatives and we don't have a lot of competition there never mind for state rep or state senate which are smaller, but you know, still uh, are not as low as other states. Yeah, you know what it would make uh, would probably I, I think would end the stream of money being spent on ballot campaigns, public financing. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to put a ballot, if you want to run, you know, if you want to run a run a ballot campaign, it's you know you can, you know, we'll give you some reimbursement. You'll have to go out and get your signatures, but we'll reimburse you for some of that. And, uh, you know, you'll have a pot of money to do advertising. And once you spend it down, that's it. <laughs> I mean, we we have a public financing for governor. But the problem is the money all tends to go to the Democrats. <laughs> so because it's not a lot of money and then basically it all gets used. Um <laughs> 
I, I want to th- say that, may, and I could be completely wrong here, but didn't we have like a clean election law in Massachusetts for a very brief time? And then the legislature decide we're just not going to do that. <laughs> yes, Jamie yes, is we not. did. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. So actually it was, it was worse than the legislature decided not to do that. Um, so the first thing is, so they, the ballot, they passed it in, I think, 98. Um, and then it would have become active and it, well, it became active in 2002, but the legislature said, oh, well, we're not going to fund it (laughs) because Ah. the legislature has to fund it. You can't go and do a ballot initiative and say, oh, we're going to allocate this amount of money. It's like the legislature actually has to sign off on it. So, Mm -hmm. so what ended up happening was a bunch of the candidates basically sued and they impound the the judiciary impounded a whole bunch of um state vehicles and then they sold them off <laughs> and then gave the money to the clean elections candidates <laughs> um but in addition to that the legislature said oh well we're going to it, it's unfair to give money to to these other candidates. So we're going to increase the amount of money for constituent services uh, for um, office holders, and then ah. they put the they 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 put a, a another initiative on the ballot in twenty in in two thousand two, which unfortunately the voters sided with to get rid of the clean elections law, but they never rolled back that money for constituent services. Mm. Legislatures always got to find a dime somewhere for, for themselves. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, they just, if you're homeless or if you're um, like from another country, they're just going to send you straight to jail. Can you give us an update on that, Eli? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Um, so there is a bit of a migrant, cri- ah, migrant, migrant crisis in Massachusetts. One of the ways the state has decided to alleviate that is send some migrants to a jail. Um, so the old like Bay State Correction Facility, which is in Norfolk, that closed a little while ago. and they're going to send anywhere from about 400 to 450 from what I've seen immigrants to there to help alleviate that strain a bit. And the town isn't exactly too happy about that because the town has next to no resources. It's from what I see pretty much a gas station, a pizza shop, and that's it. So there's worried. They're worried that like the um, school system is going to get pressure. I was about to say polluted, but that was by far the wrong word. Um, there's going to be a lot of people, or there's huge protests going on in the town because people aren't happy about that. Um, I fumbled that so badly with what I'm trying to say, but I think I got the important parts out. Yeah, yeah I dude. heard um, I heard a recording of some of one public meeting regard. I guess it was a select board hearing or something, and. Um, wow. Talk about NIMBYism on full display. (laughs) You know, the, the, you know, the fellow who gets up and says, well, regardless, it's, I, I, using my own community as an example, there was a hundred year period where Arlington, uh, had double digit population growth decade on decade on decade on decade. And in some, in one decade, it was even like 93%. Um, 450 people is not a huge, you know, that's, it ain't a lot. (laughs) Um, I mean, and then especially if you consider in, in comparison to, um, like what kind of the, the housing shortage that we have now, um, you know, 450 people, we, you know, we need, we need housing for a lot more than that. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I, I'm a little disappointed that this community is getting so bent out of shape and, you know, to be perfectly honest, I 
think my this is just my gut my gut feeling here but what we're seeing with uh foreign migrants is going to be just a drop in the bucket compared to what we see with internal migration um due to weather related disasters areas of the country running out of water and so on um i think we, I, I think this is just like the warm up exercise um and the real like the real the real population shifts are, are coming in a couple of years are co coming in you know perhaps a couple of decades well i think one of the questions not to play devil's advocate but here's the other side of the coin and what uh maura healy was taking so much heat for is isn't there a, a raise in crime level in the populations that have the migrants my no. understanding is no <laughs> So the statistics, if I recall correctly, are legal Im immigrants have the least crime. Um, and then I believe the next group are undocumented immigrants. And then, you know, folks who have been here a while. And, and then there's Nazis. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're in a world all their own. All their own. <laughs> I mean, and apparently in I'm France, to, it would seem. <laughs> I'm not really one to cast stones, you know, in the whole crime department, but just saying. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, I was trying to cooperate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that time when that the police mean, talked with us, gathering signatures for you? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Jamie was Jamie was fighting the was law. So fearsome. <laughs> Me and my camera. <laughs> no, but in Massachusetts, we do have a state law that um, you know you ha in Massachusetts you have a right to shelter. Yeah. Uh, so you know what the governor is just is doing by housing people on and you know an un a currently unused piece of state property is. You know, she's trying to follow. She's trying to, you know, basically follow the law. <laughs> um, you know, I. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with her on this one. Yeah, but she also said all the people at Logan, all the immigrants, undocumented immigrants at Logan, have to like find new places, mm -hmm. and the legislature hasn't exactly been forthcoming with more money, or at least yeah. enough for the need, but. I mean, yep. isn't Concord also going to be closing soon? I mean, we could take advantage of that, turn that into community housing. I mean, I have no problem using government resources to do community housing, especially for low-income mm -hmm. emergency housing. You know, a roof is a roof, you know, and you can take out the concrete bed and put in a real one. Yeah, I mean... Um... There's a real fancy hotel called the, uh, I think it's a Char Charles Street Hotel, but it's down by Charles MGH. And, you know, back in the day, it used to be a prison. Um, <laughs> it's pretty fancy now. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, adaptive reuse is a thing. Um, and we're, you know, we have facilities and that can be reused or repurposed. Um, yeah, we should totally be doing that. Yeah, especially if it's not crumbling. So. Mm -hmm. So speaking of housing, Steve, can you get us an update on what the Massachusetts Senate has approved? So the Senate uh, this past week did their deliberations on the bond bill. So the House uh, passed it some time ago. The Senate had their turn this week. Uh, there were 332 amendments, um, it, which, you know, I skimmed through some of them. It's, it's you know, it's something, there's enough there that you really need you know, you need staff to go through this sort of stuff for you to really understand it, because some of them are very technical, like, you know, you'll change in chapter X, section Y, paragraph Z, you're going to uh, remove these three words. And, you know, it takes a while to, you know, to sort of dig in and figure out what that's doing. But um, a lot of the things in the in the bond bill were housing related. Uh, one common one was uh, communities. Um, you know, amendments asking that would basically uh, allocate more money to house authorities in different communities. A lot of those seem to pass. Um, my own uh, senator, uh, Cindy Friedman, put in, um, you know, 
put in a request to increase funding for the Arlington Housing Authority. And I think that was ado adopted. And, you know, that that's all well and good. Housing authorities tend to need money. <laughs> you know, that's just a thing right now. Um, it looks like the um, like the provision for accessory dwelling units being allowed um, in you know places where you know you can build single family homes. It looks like that made it through. Uh, there were a couple of interesting things in uh, interesting amendments. One which was titled "Technical Correction." That basically would have rewritten uh, the MBTA Communities Act to reduce the housing requirements on Milton. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's just it's like, Milton. <laughs> just Milton. <laughs> you know, it doesn't say Milton, but if you you look at the definitions and it's like, oh, this is what it's doing. Um, fortunately, that was knocked down. As were you know some other amendments that would have. Um, provided what I'll, I'll I'll use the term weasel room for communities that didn't want to comply to sort of get around or try to uh, shirk compliance and you know that stuff stayed in that you know those they were voted down out of the 332 amendments only most of them were voice votes there were only three that were roll call um, so you know it's we don't know. Uh, who voted where except for three cases. One bit that I was hoping to see go the, you know, it was knocked out of the House version. I was hoping to see it get back into the Senate was uh, the option for a real estate transfer fee. Um, and it basically your, it would allow local, you know, communities to pass a local bylaw saying that, you know, we're going to, <clears throat> tax like half a percent on of home sales over a million dollars and we'll use the money to build uh, affordable or you know income restricted housing uh the senate did not have the appetite for putting that back in <clears throat> excuse me but at the end of the day um we, now we have a house version and a senate version and this goes into reconciliation as early as next week and you know, maybe in it won't be too long before we know what the uh, what the actual thing looks like uh, as it goes to the governor. Joy. So, what's the particular bill if people want to uh, contact their house <laughs> member to say they support the Senate version or whatever? Well, this house has already voted, so it's I, I don't know the which... reconciliation. Yeah, I don't know who who's on the reconciliation committee, but the okay. Senate bill is S twenty eight thirty four, and you go, you can go to malegislature.gov and read all about it. So all in all, a win. Overall, yeah, I think there's some good stuff in there. It's you know the the housing problem is um, you know it's something it's it's been decades in the making it will take decades to fix and this is kind of like the next iteration of talking about what to do and and actually doing some stuff so it's the the doing some stuff part that i'm you know i'm rather encouraged to see the only thing i'm worried about is like the giant complexes that become basically the basis for judge dread movies you know where it's the <laughs> you know exactly what i'm talking about but you know we we got to do something because these people need help and and it's the right thing to do public housing can be beautiful if we put the money into making it beautiful just saying if we if we oh, yeah. underfund it if we don't maintain it then yes it gets run down same thing as your luxury apartments if they're not maintaining the elevator if you got or the plumbing it becomes an awful place to live so, but it, I'm, what I'm trying to say to it is it's more than just stopping at building the house. It's building the support structure so that people can better their lives. And most importantly, you have the hope to continue climbing the ladder and getting, getting them themselves and their families. So that includes the education that includes, it includes all the pieces. That's the American dream, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it, it takes more than just the housing, but that is the right start. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think the American dream is honestly due for an update. You know, it used to be a, a, a house with a white picket fence and two cars in the suburbs. Now I think, you know, it, we would be better with um, mid-rise flats next to a public park and a train station. <laughs> Carbon emissions, just saying. <laughs> I want my rocket boots, so. <laughs> Castles in the sky. His city's in the sky. Um, hey, don't tempt me. Don't tempt well, me. No, no, no. That was actually a thing for a while. Um, you know, there's, there, there's, a, there's a castle in the sky in New Hampshire. <laughs> Well, I was actually thinking Castles in the Sky was basically the idea to have elevated development over uh, I-90. Um, there is <laughs> no, seriously, it was it was an ambition once once upon a time. And there's a, a star market in what is it, Newton yeah. or something that, you know, goes over the highway. And a hotel, and now, I think. Right. Isn't there a hotel over the star market? Yep. I, that I'm not sure of, but okay. uh, currently under construction, and it looks like, or near getting, looks like it's getting near completion, uh, down by the Boylston's, no, the Heinz, Heinz Convention Center stop on the Green Line, uh, mm -hmm. sort of in Back Bay. There's a, uh, you know, two big towers. What over, you know, what used to be a big, <laughs> expansive highway. <laughs> um, highways are loud. I'm not opposed to burying that shit. <laughs> Well, there's also a lot of urban development going on in Boston where they're getting ready, where they're making giant, giant, giant cisterns in order to hold a eventual like thousand year, hundred year storm water as well, because we're getting ready for that as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, even even if you are building, um, you know, sing in and even if you are building single family homes, there are going to be stormwater. A lot of communities will have stormwater bylaws. And yeah, if you have a driveway that pitches down to the road, um, yeah, you're going to have to do something so that that sucker don't cheat flow. Well, there's one in Somerville that they're building that's it's right near the U-Haul and there's going to be a park put above it. Mm -hmm. But underneath it, underneath the park is going to be this ginormous cavern that's just designed to hold all that water. Yep. It's uh, pretty big. Central Square has one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is flood mitigation is good. <laughs> so with that, thank you for watching uh, this week's episode of the Massachusetts Pirate Party News. Uh, thank you, Eli, Steve, and Joe for joining me on this endeavor. Um, we hope you all have a uh, wonderful week. We will, we're planning to have a meeting this Thursday. Uh, so if you're interested in helping us make decisions, uh, by all means, uh, check out masspirates.org. There'll be information there in the sidebar. So with that, hold the phone. Yep. Hold the phone. Hold the phone. Yep. Thursday's the f uh, holiday. Oh. It's Next, the it's, week from Thursday. Yes, yeah, that was. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Fourth Fourth of July, also known as Scare the Dog Day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, um, one more thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, July third, um, I believe at six p.m. Anyways, check. We'll we'll post it at masspirates.org. Um, now that Julian Assange is out of Belmarsh prison, uh, flew to, I think, Guam? No, not Guam. Like, M Marshall Islands or something? Got, did a plea deal for time served, and now he's back in Australia with his family. So, uh, Yay. that is a great thing, but... Uh, on the third, in front of the B, in front of the British um, consulate, there will be a celebration for that. Um, we'll put in the link in the description, and it'll be at masspirates.org. So come on out for that. Uh, one more quick thing: mm -hmm. uh, Isn't England doing an election on the fourth? Yeah, we really just have influence on them, don't we? I mean, France just had their first round today. Um, 
So, yeah, it'll be nice to see the Tories like go down in a burning <laughs> mess. Well, really? So really they're they're having an election on Good Riddance Day. <laughs> <laughs> and with that great have a great night folks. Like, share, subscribe, comment and all that other jets. Thank you all. Take care. <laughs>